Don't get cross because I tick. It's Tourette syndrome. Thank you for taking the time to view this presentation to learn more about Tourette syndrome. I'm Robin Latimer, the President of the Tourette Syndrome Association of Australia and also a mother of two children with Tourette's. I really appreciate the opportunity to share information on Tourette syndrome as I believe the ripple effect of education is the key to helping people with TS to be better understood in our communities. We'll start with a teacher's perspective. Educators do not need to be experts. There is so much information out there these days that teachers are expected to know of, but a certain level of familiarity is essential and can make an enormous difference. No two cases are alike and the range of symptoms is huge. But once you accept the premise that each situation is unique and changeable, you will be better prepared to welcome a young person with Tourette syndrome. You as the teacher are the role model. Your students will take cues from you of how to treat a child with TS. So promote respect for the student. The Tourette Syndrome Association of Australia has its national office in Sydney. It was founded in 1989 and is the only national, voluntary, non-profit membership organisation dedicated to identifying the cause, finding the cure and controlling the effects of TS. We offer telephone and email support, hold support groups, an informative website and have a members only online forum to help break down the feelings of isolation some may feel, particularly those who are not in areas where our support groups operate. We have a publications list for resources available including an educators pack specifically for teachers. Doctors lists to help find appropriate and experienced medical help. We also have professional support from our medical advisor of 21 years, Professor Satchdev, Head of Neuropsychiatry at Prince of Wales Hospital, Sydney. We hold a National Awareness Week each May, as well as information seminars and social events throughout the year. Members receive our quarterly newsletter, where event and support group details, together with up-to-date information on TS, are published so please feel free to contact us any time. What is Tourette Syndrome? TS is a neurobiological disorder. A basic explanation is the brain is overstimulated with an excess of neurotransmitters or chemicals that bypass the filters in the brain which would normally be used to control one's movement, thoughts, emotions, actions and working memory. It is genetic, so TS is hereditary and varies in presentation even within families with the same genetic makeup. TS is characterised by rapid, repetitive and involuntary muscle movements and vocalisations called tics and often involves behavioural difficulties. TS is not degenerative and people with TS can expect to live a normal lifespan. The tics will naturally wax and wane and vary from person to person. TS is treatable and for a majority tics get better with advancing age. It most often begins between the ages of 2 and 21 and lasts throughout life in varying degrees of severity. Doctors today estimate that as many as 1 in 100 boys and 1 in 300 girls have TS. As more doctors are learning to recognise and diagnose TS, these numbers are likely to increase. On top of these statistics are vast numbers of individuals with mild symptoms who go undiagnosed as they do not seek medical attention. The first documentation on TS was in 1825, so we have known about it for a long time. However, unfortunately, many people, including medical professionals, still do not understand the complexities of TS. Appropriate medical care can help control the symptoms. Understanding can accomplish even more by preventing much of the humiliation, rejection and resulting emotional damage associated with TS. TS can upset many aspects of a person's life, both public and private as well as the lives of peers, relatives,
teachers, employers and co-workers. They too must face the awkward task of dealing with the constant distraction, interruption and embarrassment ticks can cause. Here you can see a chart of common tics of Tourette's syndrome. In the top half we have what are called simple or involuntary meaningless movements divided in two columns. On the left you have motor tics and on the right you have vocal or phonic tics. Simple tics involve one muscle group and in the motor category they are things such as eye blinking, eye rolling, squinting, facial grimaces, shoulder shrugging, arm extending, mouth opening, nose twitching, lip licking, head jerks, brushing or tossing hair out of the eyes. And in the simple phonic or vocal category, there are things like throat clearing, grunting, snorting, yelling, screaming, sniffing, barking, laughing, coughing, spitting, squeaking, humming, whistling and honking. Then below that line we have in both those categories complex tics which involve more than one muscle group and these are described as involuntary seemingly purposeful movements. Involuntary is not a spelling mistake it is a term to distinguish between voluntary and involuntary created for Tourette's syndrome because there is a slight uh, difference between these tics where some people can have the ability to suppress them for a period of time. On the left we have the motor complex tics which are things like pulling of clothes, touching of people or objects, poking, smelling fingers, punching, jumping, walking on toes, kissing, feet shuffling, flapping arms and those sorts of movements. There's also internal tics like breathing tics, bladder and bowel tics. I've heard of a child who had a bladder tic where he kept having to put his hand up in class to tell his teacher he needed to go to the bathroom and each time he went he didn't need to go and this went on and on throughout the day and it caused a lot of confusion because the teacher didn't realise it was in fact a tick. There's things like self-injurious behaviours like biting or picking skin or scabs. There's copapraxia, sexually touching oneself or others and making obscene gestures. There's echopraxia which is echoing or taking on others actions and the repetition of your own actions and there's coprographia which is the writing of obscene words or phrases. Then on the right hand side in the vocal or phonic category of complex tics there's things like making animal like sounds, unusual changes of pitch or volume of voice, stuttering and echolalia which is repeating what others say or imitation of sounds of others, palilalia which is repetition of the last word, phrase or syllable and coprolalia, which is obscenities or socially taboo phrases. Now coprolalia is the most famous tick of TS. However, less than 10% of all people with TS have this symptom. It is the one most used in the media and movies and things because of the sensational quality of it. There's also mental tics, such as mental coprolalia, which is thinking of obscene or socially taboo thoughts, mental palilalia, silently saying to oneself words, and mental echolalia, silently saying to oneself words that were said by others. Then there are other kinds of tics, such as dystonic tics, which are movements that are sustained in a posture, and sensory tics, such as the feeling of a tickle, or warmth, cold, pain, or other sensations in localised regions. An example of this is having physical irritation in the eyes when seeing something sharp. Some children will try to mask their tics by making a head shaking tick look like they are shaking their hair out of their eyes for example. But please remember that tics are involuntary and not controllable. The nature of tics. Tics have a natural waxing and waning cycle. This cycle can vary and it will vary from each child to another child. It will vary from a period, for a period of months. It will also have a waxing and waning cycle that might be a, a weekly cycle from the Monday to Sunday routine. 
There will also be a waxing and waning cycle on a daily basis, on an hourly basis, and even getting into the fine-tuning things per minute. Um, things that affect this waxing and waning cycle are individual. However, some common stories are, for example, the cycle of a school term might be the beginning of school term and the end of school term are the waxing phases when symptoms are exacerbated or peaking and in the middle of term when things are more settled and routined are when they are likely to be waning. Some children I hear of um, do better during school holidays because they're more relaxed. However, some children actually wax more during the school holidays because of the loss of routine. So it is a very individual condition, um, but just be aware that this happens. It can cause a lot of confusion because sometimes a child might be really on the ball and able to concentrate and focus and do their schoolwork and not be having ticks in one week, and then the following week their focus or attentional problems are exacerbated, their tics are exacerbated and it may appear um, to the untrained eye as though it is put on and purposeful when in fact it's not. It's just the difference of these natural waxing and waning cycles. There are times when symptoms of TS are absent because a person is absorbed in an activity that is compelling for them. For example, there's a surgeon in the US with TS who can perform operations tick-free without having to consciously suppress them. But suppressing is difficult, exhausting, and often results in explosion ticks later in the day. So some assume and expect students are able to control their ticks when they want. But this is not the case for everyone. What makes us tick? Aggravations. What comes first with the comorbid disorders, the chicken or the egg? Any other associated conditions need to be taken into account and calming their symptoms first may be helpful to TS. Anxiety and stress are known triggers for TS symptoms. Grief and strong emotion can exacerbate symptoms. Excitement and good stress such as holidays and transitions can exacerbate. Hunger and tiredness. Substances particularly stimulants within um, sports drinks and uh, Coca-Cola and things like that. Physical health, infections and other illnesses, and sleep deprivation. Many of these children have difficulty going to sleep and have restless sleep, which can exacerbate both tics and behaviour. Children with TS are more susceptible to bullying such as mimicking symptoms um, which causes problems. Tourette syndrome is more than tics. It is a very complex condition. Most children have a combination of related issues as well as the tics. Just being aware of these possibilities can be helpful in understanding the child. Over 80% of those with TS also have other comorbid or associated conditions. Often these neurological conditions present prior to tics and can cause frustration and confusion for everyone involved. Some people may have a diagnosis of one or two other conditions, while others may have elements of many of them. For many, the accompanying neurological conditions cause more difficulty than do the tics. It is helpful if educators are aware of the possibility of related difficulties and their symptoms and aware of effective accommodations, modifications and supports to assist the child affected. Without this information, behaviour may be misinterpreted as intentional, resulting in inappropriate interventions, failure for the student and aggravations of symptoms. I'm just going to talk about a few of the more common associated conditions with Tourette syndrome. Dysgraphia is very common. Its characteristics include slow and laborious writing, hand and finger cramping, sloppy handwriting such as uneven spacing, irregular margins and inconsistent lettering, the inability to copy correctly from book to paper or board to paper, 
the inability to transfer thoughts onto the paper. It doesn't mean they don't have the thoughts, it's just they can't get them from their brain down onto the paper. This can be addressed with the use of computer technologies. Some children are eligible for scribes. Other ways you can help is to ensure that notes taken throughout the day are supplied to them at the end of the day. Obsessive Compulsive Disorder, which is a type of anxiety. OCD is difficult to live with because it is often invisible. Depending on how mild or severe, it may go unrecognised by the parent. Living with OCD can make a child feel stuck or driven to perfectionism. Obsessions are intrusive, unwanted and recurring thoughts, images or impulses which cause distress. And compulsions are behaviours or actions performed to alleviate the distress caused by those unwanted intrusive thoughts. Common obsessions are unrealistic fears and worries, concern for symmetry or need for certainty. And typical compulsions are repetitive behaviours or rituals such as rereading, rewriting, checking, cleaning, counting, ordering or doing something until it feels just right. Seeking reassurance by asking the same question repeatedly despite having been answered. OCD is often not apparent to the teacher or other students. Compulsions often need to be performed over and over again. Some children do not tell anyone about their obsessions or compulsions as they know they are irrational and make them feel crazy. This leads to feelings of isolation. They need to know they are living with a recognised condition to reassure them. Attention Deficit Disorder is very common with TS. It is a combination of inattention, impulsive behaviour, poor concentration, poor short-term memory with or without hyperactivity, excitability and problems with executive function. Most boys with ADHD stand out because of hyperactivity and that kind of activity. In girls, one of the most common symptoms is incessant talking and the need to continually speak and finish what they're saying even when they've been asked to stop. This learning disorder may be self-perpetuating. Failure leads to frustration, which leads to anxiety about performance, which then exacerbates the failure. Problems may occur when the student is transitioning from one task to another, has sudden schedule change, has unstructured time in the classroom or playground, is given several instructions at once, is given a long assignment, is looking for someone to sit with at lunchtime, or has to sit still for any length of time. Executive dysfunction is often associated with ADHD and its difficulties include managing time, forming goals, organising materials and activities, starting and completing tasks, breaking down long assignments and projects, sequencing information and dealing with the unexpected. Executive dysfunction involves the frontal lobe of the brain which is responsible for organisation of time, materials, belongings and thoughts. Students may appear lazy, purposely forgetful, deliberately late and unmotivated. Living with TS. What matters most, the behavioural issues or the tics? Address the main problems for the individual. Often these are not the tics or will fluctuate between the two at different times and ages. Often in younger children, the tics are not so much of an issue. It might be more the behavioural because they're in environments where a lot of movement and noise is permitted. But as the children grow older, they're expected to sit still and quiet for longer periods of time, and that's often when the tics will become more of an issue.
TS is commonly misunderstood to be a behavioural or emotional condition rather than a neurological condition. Typical behavioural intervention is a reactive program based on rewards and consequences. However, a proactive and positive approach is best suited to meet the needs of Tourette's syndrome. An example is a child wearing glasses. They are not told to remove their glasses and use a bit more willpower and they'll be able to read the blackboard. It is accepted that they have that need and they are allowed to have that proactive support. They may also be positioned in a better spot in the classroom so that they can see the blackboard more clearly. That's another proactive support. I'm going to play a game with you. I'd like everyone to stand up. Even if you're listening to this on your own, I'd really like you to participate. I'm going to read a paragraph to you from one of our brochures and while I'm reading you're not allowed to blink. If you blink I'd like you to sit down. Starting from now. Tourette's syndrome is a neurological disorder which most often begins between the ages of 2 and 21 and lasts throughout life. TS is not degenerative and people with TS can expect to live a normal lifespan. TS is characterised by rapid, repetitive and involuntary muscle movements and vocalisations called tics and often involves behavioural difficulties. The term involuntary used to describe tics is a source of confusion since it is known that most people with TS do have some control over their symptoms. What is often not recognised is that the control which can be exerted from seconds to hours at a time only delays more severe outbursts of symptoms. Ticks are experienced as irresistible and eventually must be performed. I'll stop there. Those of you who are still standing, I have some questions for you. First of all, can you tell me what I just read? Most of you will be able to just give me a general outline, but not many specifics. And when I ask why that is, they say because they were focusing so hard on not blinking, they couldn't hear what I was saying. This is what it's like for a child in the classroom to suppress ticks, to be holding them off. They have to focus on holding off the ticks and therefore cannot be hearing the instructions given by the teacher. So it comes at a great cost for their ability to learn. My second question is, the longer you're held off, you're blinking, did the urge or desire to blink become stronger or weaker? Most people respond with stronger. Again, this is what it's like when you're suppressing ticks. The build-up gets stronger and stronger until eventually you have to perform the tick. And my last question is, when you did allow yourself to blink, did you blink just once or several times? The majority of people say several times. They overcompensate. And that's again what happens when ticks are suppressed. They build up and build up and become more explosive and have to overcompensate. So it's really important that children are in an environment where they're allowed to tick throughout the day to avoid that build up. And let's remember, you were only given one tick to suppress. This is not enough to qualify for a diagnosis of TS. To have TS, you have to have two or more motor ticks and at least one vocal tick. So what reduces the symptoms? Medication. This is used for tics as well as for related behaviours such as ADHD, OCD, anxiety etc. as part of the management strategy. An experienced physician is very important. There is no medication specific for Tourette syndrome so it's very much trial and error and there are always side effects. Unfortunately you can't drug the part of the brain specific to Tourette's, it drugs the entire brain. The environment, family dynamics to everyday routines really affect Tourette's syndrome. So planning and systematic organisation are difficult for some. So creating a calm routine environment is helpful. Physical activity is a real win-win. Sport and physical activity channel those excess energy 
that excess energy positively while improving mood and physical health. Focused activities. Hyperfocus is an advantage of Tourette syndrome. Talents and hobbies can relieve symptoms of TS if absorbing. Finding what that particular interesting absorbing hobby is for that child is so important. If they can find one thing they're good at and are interested in, they can experience what it's like to be tick free and they can also experience success. Managing ticks through awareness training, cognitive behaviour therapy, habit reversal training, competing response and a new therapy called CBIT which stands for Comprehensive Behavioural Intervention for Ticks is proving very good although there's not many people in Australia trained in this treatment at this stage. Relaxation, family and social support. With these kind of help uh, a psychologist is a good place to start. There's substitution of different words or actions such as elastic bands on wrists for, for people that might have a tick where a whole arm movement is needed. They can just flick the elastic bands on their wrists to divert that energy. Squeezing a stress ball. Clasping hands together or clenching fists. Concentrated deep breathing can help. And chewing gum can help to avoid vocal ticks by using up the excess energy in that region. Other relaxation therapies are things like massage, meditation, yoga, tai chi, calming music, long walks, being in nature, swimming or whatever works for you to reduce stress levels. TS symptoms are often seen as behavioural or emotional difficulties and intervened with reactive programs such as reward and consequences. However, as TS is a neurological problem, it should be given a proactive and positive approach. Classroom modifications. Firstly, you need to create an emotionally safe environment. These strategies will help both the teacher and student experience success. They will decrease stress and anxiety, maximise structure and predictability, enhance the student's receptivity to learning and reduce undesired incidents between the student, peers and teacher. There are many strategies that a school can implement to assist a child with TS. Sometimes they are fairly obvious, but others may, may require more creativity. To designate a safe place for the student to go when ticks are severe is, is really important. This might be the sick bay area, the office, the school counsellor, a particular staff member, it may be a bean bag in the back of corner of the classroom or a spot in the hat room. Positive proactive support, supports for Tourette's are things like preferential seating. This might be near the door for a child that needs to be able to go to his safe his or her safe zone on a regular basis, or it might mean being up at the front of the classroom directly near the teacher to avoid um, lack of focus. Reducing stressful situations and supporting friendships can be really helpful. And to educate all the staff at school is important. Quite often incidents occur in unstructured times such as lunch time when the child is not in the care of their regular teacher. And to help with note taking is important particularly with handouts, um, making sure that that child gets that handout. They might be able to have a scribe or they might be able to have the use of a computer to help with that problem with writing. A timeout pass or a signal can be arranged. In high school the timeout passes work really well because you have many teachers to deal with. If you are in primary school and have the one teacher you might create a signal so that the teacher knows you need to leave the classroom right now. If the child has to put their hand up and wait for the teacher to answer, the, the ticks will have occurred. So there needs to be a situation where they can um, exit as soon as possible, as soon as they feel an urge or a sensation coming. Having, ticular, sorry, having regular tick breaks is also good. So frequent breaks allowing opportunities for movement. 
You might use that child to run errands. Um, might allow them to go to the bathroom a bit more frequently just so they get some exercise. Running errands is good not only for the movement opportunities but also it promotes self-esteem as it makes them feel important. And making accommodations for accomplishing work. Sometimes this involves alternatives. For example, if a student has very strong vocal tics, it might be too much or overwhelming to ask them to do a speaking task in front of the whole year group. It might be better to ask them to select a few of their peers who they trust or even um, to record their talk at home where they're in a more trustful environment. They might qualify for extended time for tests and assignments or even taking those in a separate room so that they're not distracted by worrying about how they might distract other students and they can reach their full potential in those tests. And holding regular meetings to aid organisation can be very helpful, particularly in high school, where students have a, a busy timetable and they're given assignments from many teachers overlapping. They might need regular help to break those down and make them achievable. And building the schedule around the students' productive times of day can really help particularly the children who have sleep problems. They often don't wake up until around lunchtime, so they don't learn much in the morning sessions. And then there are children who may not eat their lunch and are fatigued by the afternoon, and so they don't learn much in the afternoon sessions. So this is obviously very individual to each child. So we say to invite, not pressure the student to participate in school life. Behavioural management. Students find that tick symptoms increase during stress and need proactive measures. ADHD causes impulsive and inattentive behaviour creating discipline issues. There is a difference between willful disobedience and uncontrollable behaviour. One way to help distinguish the above is by establishing positive communications. Most children will own culpability if they feel they are in an environment of trust. Behaviour is communication. Understand the purpose of the student's behaviour. A teacher's and parent's best antidote to misbehaviour is a willingness to be helpful. So praise the student no matter how small the success. Set clear explicit rules and expectations. Always state rules positively as the TS student is, says, is suggestible. And repeat the rules often. Repeat the rules often. Warn and prepare for transitions. And be flexible. The severity and intensity of symptoms will wax and wane and change. TS is not an excuse for bad behaviour. So encourage the student to assume responsibility for failure. Mistakes are valuable learning experiences. Accommodations at school. Accommodations are a balancing act between including the student in all school activities and organising their experience so that they can participate on their own terms. This may cause conflict with some school policies, but fair does not equal equal. A child mimicking tics or being deliberately disruptive and the child with tics or ADHD cannot be held responsible in the same way. The parent, teacher and student relationship form a team. Work with the family to identify times when symptoms are bad. Identify and foster the strengths of the child such as art, music or sport to build their self-esteem. Share information with parents. An informed, caring and supportive envir environment makes all the difference. Whatever happens at school affects the family when that child walks through the front door. Factors of importance. For social adaptation, the seriousness of attentional problems and intelligence which is not affected by TS the degree of family acceptance and support and ego strength are often more important 
than the severity of motor and vocal tics. Some children with severe tics will go through life quite carefree because they have a strong ego, while other children who have seemingly innocuous or mild tics, yet a fragile ego, have devastating results from this condition. So true acceptance provides a sense of security promoting self-esteem and self-esteem is vital to achieving self-advocacy. School performance handicaps require special intervention. Even a bright student with TS who does not have a specific learning disability but has attentional problems will have their optimal functioning limited without special provisions in place. The capacity to cope is not always dependent on the actual symptoms, but linked to personality, family and individual experiences. School can provide a safe place for children with TS to develop the coping, the coping skills they will need as adults. Positives of TS People with TS often excel in creativity, intellect, sports and musical ability. OCD can make one have an excellent eye for detail and accuracy. The common trait of having a strong sense of injustice is surely not so bad for society. And ADHD can make a person full of energy and enthusiasm. The personal experience of difference can create empathy for others. There have been many exceptionally successful people with Tourette syndrome. Australian Robbie Madison is freestyle motocross world champion at the time of this talk. Jim Eisenreich is the US baseball legend. Mahmoud Abdul Rauf is a US famous basketballer. And Tim Howard has represented the United States of America and Everton Football Club as goalie. Napoleon Bonaparte, military and political leader of France. Peter the Great, Emperor of Russia. Mozart, composer of the classical era, and Samuel Johnson, author of the first English dictionary in 1755, were all believed to have had Tourette syndrome. I'll leave you with a quote by Professor Valsama Epen that gives hope. Biology does not determine destiny. And finally, on my last slide is a TV commercial we made in 2008 for Awareness Week. Sometimes it makes me feel embarrassed if there's somebody that says, hey, what did you do that for and stuff. Well, one of them is where I shake my head to get my hair out of my eyes. There's another one where I sort of do like a little squeaking in my throat. There used to be another one where I had to spell every word that I hear. I don't notice it when I'm playing football or concentrating on something like that. Tourette syndrome is a neurological disorder that affects thousands of Australians. It is characterised by involuntary movements and vocal noises called tics. We can't help it and we're just like you in every other way. People with Tourette's just want to be understood and accepted. So visit www.tourette.org.au to help us help those with Tourette's. <laughs>